Okay, thank you um, and welcome everybody. Um, greetings from Wakayama University in Wakayama, Japan. My name is Joseph Chia and I'm based here at the Center for Tourism Research. Thank you for uh, attending our um, irregular webinar series. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased today to be presenting work um, that's very current and very relevant to much of the things that we do here at Wakayama University. I would like to acknowledge and welcome our speaker today, Associate Professor Dr. Susanna Cleon, who you can see on the screen there. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with Japan, Susanna's in the, in the north and I'm in the southwest. So where she is, it's snowing, and where I am, the sun is out. <laughs> so, um, and greetings to all of you. I see that uh, we have um, uh, uh, participants from across Asia, from Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and we also have some very um, uh, um, interested people from Europe, where it's very early in the morning in, uh, in um, the Netherlands, France, um, Great Britain, and Austria as well, and Richard in New Zealand. Thank you, everyone. Welcome aboard. Firstly, before I hand over to um, uh, Dr. Klian, I'm going to introduce her just briefly. Uh, so Susanna Klian has been Associate Professor at the Modern Japanese Studies Program at Hokkaido University since 2013. She was previously affiliated at the German Institute of Japanese Studies in Tokyo, uh, Waseda University, Humboldt University in Berlin, and the Freie University in Berlin, as well as with Kyoto University. So having studied translation and interpreting English, Japanese, and French, at the University of Vienna. Susanna pursued a PhD in international relations at the University of Vienna. Her main interests, research interests include local traditions, rural revitalization, tourism, explorations of locality, space and place, demographic change, and alternative forms of living and working in post-growth Japan. She has pursued qualitative research, um, ethnography at the cross-section of Japanese studies, anthropology, human geography, and tourism studies, and she has worked closely with local governments in Hokkaido to organize student workshops about regional revitalization and tourism, as well as provided her expert input at local events to research groups and governmental institutions. So that's Susanna, but one of the main uh, thing, reasons we wanted to invite her is because of her most impressive book. Now, I'm not sure if many people have had the chance to read it, but presumably if you're interested in the issues that Susanna is talking about today, and I will refer to her, Susanna, rather than Dr. Klein, in my very casual Australian way. <laughs> um, um, it's, an, it's, it's a book that I think everybody should have on their shelves, especially if you're interested in, in rural um, uh, demographic change and those kinds of things. But just to give you an idea of what this book is about, I will read a, a review uh, of the book in, um, uh, I think, the uh, Asian Anthropology, I think the journal was, by Liliana Moray from Temple University. She says about the book, rural exodus, shrinking population and economic decline have become pressing issues in Japan. In order to counter the still dominant trend of rural to urban migration, the Japanese government has put in place programs of rural revitalization that aim to draw highly qualified young migrants in search of a better and more fulfilling life to the countryside. Together with a shift in societal perception of rural areas as civilization's backwaters to places of hope, creativity and experimentation, growing numbers of young Japanese have been turning away from increasingly unconvincing promises of a stable income in lifelong corporate employment and desires of material wealth to engage in a variety of projects aimed at local professional and personal development. And this monograph by uh, uh, Susanna Klein focuses on such individuals, often described as lifestyle migrants, young, highly educated and generally ambitious urbanites of 20 to 45 years of age who choose to relocate to rural areas, not for economic reasons, but in the pursuit of self-realization, self-determination, freedom, well-being, and a meaningful life. And these issues have become ever more important in the, in the shadow of the pandemic. So with that said, I will hand over to Susanna to start her presentation. So Susanna, welcome and thank you again. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for uh, this invitation. I'm very excited. Uh, I'll now try to share my slides. So um, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna um, present one chapter from, from my book, um, which is about social entrepreneurs between self-determination and structural constraints today. Um, so uh, 
Yes, I am. greetings from the very north of Japan. Uh, I'm based in Hokkaido uh, presently. Um, we've had uh, record masses of snow this year. <laughs> so um, there's quite a gap between the pictures I'm going to show and um, my location, I'm afraid, um, because my field work was actually um, close to Wakayama in Tokushima Prefecture, uh, but also in uh, northern Japan. So the picture on uh, on this uh, on the very first slide is from Kamiyama town, um, Tokushima prefecture, and this is one of the locations um, I conducted um, my field work for uh, the book um, Urban Migrants in Rural Japan between Agency and Anomi in a post growth Society. Um, so uh, this is about the, uh, the seventh chapter, uh, which is really about individuals who, um, after relocating to, uh, to the countryside, um, start um, entrepreneurial activities um, that also benefit uh, society. Um, but I would like to add that um, most of the individuals I have followed um, did not really uh, make a big um, kind of point about this. They just went ahead uh, with such activities and um, in the process kind of um, got awards um, and uh, got kind of media attention, et cetera. Uh, but they, most of them really didn't uh, kind of announce uh, their, their ventures as being um, social entrepreneurship. So maybe this is something to keep in mind that um, the awareness of doing social entrepreneurship is quite different um, here in Japan compared to other places perhaps. So um, yeah, just uh, as Joseph has already mentioned, um, my book is really about um, redefining, reconstructing uh, rural areas we tend to think that the countryside is um, something uh, that is associated with uh, traditions, with folklore, with senior citizens, uh, with stagnation. Um, but what I really saw um, during my uh, nine years of uh, field work uh, was more that uh, rural areas um, often um, function as sites of experimentation because um, they offer uh, much cheaper living expenses uh, space, there's lots of space around that people can use if they um, have the right networks. So it's all about social capital in a way. Um, and also um, you, people can access um, networks much more easily than in cities. Um, some places like Kamiyama town in Tokushima prefecture, southwestern Japan, have uh, quite a community of uh, newcomers. So um, it's actually quite um, easy and also um, a great place to, to try to, to do a startup because there's already other startups and there is a network of people doing uh, similar things. So um, this has actually attracted more and more people um, now also during the pandemic so that um, this of course uh, gives rise to new pressures um, that some people who consider moving to such places think uh, they may be not good enough because there's already so many of, of other newcomers in that place. So uh, there has been quite a, a lot of change during the pandemic with regard to rural moves. Uh, and hopefully you can talk about this later. But um, generally we can say that uh, a lot of experimental lifestyles um, have taken part in uh, rural areas. Um, so for example, um, shared housing, people, um, rather kind of um, going for the shared economy, sharing their houses uh, with others. And also um, some people um, also uh, pursuing several uh, jobs at once rather than just going for one job as conventionally um, usual. And um, so there's really a lot of, of leeway for new lifestyles, new work styles that people have uh, made use of. So uh, one of the catchphrases that a lot of people uh, really um, talk about is waku waku, this kind of sense of um, vibrant passion, um, excitement, um, happiness. Um, and many people are, are going to the countryside to actually look for this. Others um, kind of have a pretty concrete vision what uh, waku waku may be for them. So uh, in any case, it's a lot uh, around in social media, also in, in academic discourses. Uh, and I think it's one of the key uh, words that have um, featured in many uh, narratives of people I talked to. So another thing that um, really um, 
turned out to be a feature, a key feature is um, sustainability, both um, at a personal level, um, but also at a societal level. So people trying to uh, find uh, kind of find something that really is more fulfilling to them, but also something that uh, makes sense to them um, at a community level. So they're trying to form communities uh, of like-minded people and um, also achieve change. Um, and the cases of social entrepreneurs I'm going to um, uh, discuss later are, are really examples of hoping to achieve such change. Um, another thing is really that a lot of the people I've met um, are very much living in the here and now. So uh, rather than making grand plans, uh, they, they kind of focus on the moment. Uh, and this is also because uh, a lot of them have um, opted out of lifelong employment and um, they just want to focus on um, pursuing meaningful lives, which of course involves a lot of pressure, a lot of challenges and um, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but most of my interlocutors have not understood uncertainty as something necessarily negative. So um, they were just taking it as something uh, inevitable in a way. So um, living for the moment is really also maybe a, a key um, thing here. And um, I'd like to, to start um, with thinking uh, what kind of associations, um, what kind of perceptions uh, we find in uh, recent um, presentations of um, rural Japan. So these are two um, posters from uh, governmental sources. Uh, the left, uh, the left poster is from Saitama Prefectural Government, and it's a poster that um, targets uh, new potential newcomers, so individuals who might consider moving to Saitama. Saitama, um, as I'm sure uh, most of you will know, um, is not the embodiment of uh, very glorious uh, rural living, <laughs> but it's uh, more something that. Um, has been associated with um, a bad town of Tokyo, just next to Tokyo. Uh, and so they're trying to reinvent uh, themselves in a way, the image, and try to play on the, um, uh, the very famous uh, movie um, Ozo Yasujiro made in the 1950s, Tokyo Monogatari, Tokyo Story. And, uh, and, and the poster is entitled Saitama, uh, story. So um, they are actually suggesting um, that if people move to Saitama, uh, their fam family relations are going to improve as a result. So it's quite interesting that family life quality is kind of um, associated with a rural life and uh, this image of a happy, very happy family uh, sitting on a on a summer holiday uh, feeling uh, kind of porch. Uh, is, is very much a classic, uh, black and white also, a uh, classic kind of take on that Showa summer holiday feeling, I think. Uh, and, and the post on the right hand side is um, from uh, JR campaign for a discount uh, train ticket. And it's also about um, this um, nature, like um, rule moves uh, being uh, kind of associated with um, being out in nature, enjoying uh, the sunset, uh, having time to yourself. So these are pretty uh, classic um, images of stereotypes, if you like. And uh, I think we, we can say quite safely that um, the countryside is often, uh, most often associated as um, kind of represented as the exact opposite of um, city life. Um, and I would like to uh, kind of uh, deconstruct uh, these images by showing uh, a few uh, pictures from my recent um, uh, fieldwork. Uh, and this is one of them. So this was on the second floor of a shared house in Niigata Prefecture. Uh, and um, so this is a young designer uh, from Tokyo who stayed uh, in that collective house for a few months um, to work on her garment. And um, this image really kind of could be anywhere. I think it reminded me very much of Berlin uh, in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, and it could be in any other kind of um, city really, uh, not necessarily in a, doesn't look like, uh, like uh, something from a, a village at the limits uh, as it's called <laughs> uh, in much of the literature. 
um, the clothes uh, are quite cosmopolitan. Also, the brand name Gracias Amor um, is, is uh, sounds Spanish. Um, and um, the designer was really saying that she's hoping to make clothes um, that um, set a counter statement to fast fashion. Uh, and she's hoping to um, have a personal conversation with her clients um, so that she can get a feel for what people uh, really need uh, in terms of um, garments. So I think this is just one example of uh, the great change that's happening in many parts of rural Japan and um, that these changes are very much entangled with um, places well beyond Japan on many levels. So the translocal, uh, translocality aspect is quite important here. Um, and talking about uh, rural field work, uh, we often tend to think farming, fields, um, senior citizens, uh, rustic lifestyles, folklore, uh, and, and old traditions of Japan. But my daily life, really, uh, in Tokushima, when I was doing field work, um, it looked more like this. Uh, so it's an office um, of uh, a Japanese company I've been following for quite a long time, Food Hub, uh, also in uh, Kamiyama town. And uh, this could be anywhere. This could also be in Tokyo. Uh, this could be my country. Uh, and actually, the people I talk to there, uh, many of them are not necessarily locals um, of Tokushima, but um, they have come from Tokyo, also got other places. They have uh, a working uh, history of um, in, in cities as well. So it's really uh, very much about um, fusion, uh, about hybridity. Uh, because these people, even uh, if they have left um, their, their previous um, points of, of uh, work, um, cities, they still keep maintain their relationships um, with um, their former business partners or with friends, acquaintances. Uh, so this is really a lot about flows, about connections, uh, and about negotiation rather than just um, one bounded entity, uh, as we tend to, to think. So um, just a few words about the incentives for people to uh, move from urban uh, to, uh, to the countryside. Um, and I think there's uh, three um, different uh, factors that actually um, coalesce uh, in many ways, uh, especially now the pandemic, the ongoing pandemic. So um, in terms of structure, I think um, the great East Japan earthquake in 2011 and also the um, Lehman shock in 2008 uh, where key um, events that um, kind of shape people, uh, people's kind of doubts uh, in uh, corporate employment and in their previous lifestyles. Um, and so uh, these were like natural disasters, man-made disasters um, and um, financial disasters, if you like, that kind of paved the way for um, this rethink. Uh, and um, this has also actually, of course, been um, related to institutional um, changes uh, in terms of, um, especially recently, uh, more and more companies in Japan and elsewhere offering new forms of working, uh, options of uh, remote work and um, options of kind of uh, organizing your work in new, in new ways that actually allow um, being employed in Tokyo, but not necessarily having to live in Tokyo at the same time. So quite a few people I um, know have um, pretty high paced jobs in Tokyo, have actually um, sold their um, flats in Tokyo and have uh, decided to move to some uh, rural areas that, that are kind of close to Tokyo, easy to reach. So uh, we can say that uh, now with the pandemic, um, those areas that are kind of adjacent, like Yamanashi Ken, um, Nagano Ken, Ibaraki, and these places, are actually the big winners because they have managed to attract quite a lot of um, young workers who have the freedom to uh, to actually work um, outside uh, per, um, through telework. And um, also another big factor is really um, financial uh, incentives because there have been um, all kinds of sources of funding for people interested in making rural moves. Uh, for example, um, the Chiki uh, Okoshikyoru um, Pai program. Uh, this is a, a program called um, Regional Revitalization 
uh, volunteer program uh, set up by the uh, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs um, in 2000, uh, back in 2009. Uh, this is a program that um, aims to bring in uh, urbanites for a limited period of time to rural areas to work with local governments and then make them settle in the long term. And it has been quite successful uh, because 60% of the people, uh, of these people actually um, stay on in um, these rural areas and many of them engage in entrepreneurial activities, uh, some of whom I'm going to um, talk about later. So uh, this one example, there's also um, funding for uh, people willing to um, do startups um, in rural areas. Um, companies who are willing to open satellite offices also qualify to apply for funding. Um, people who are interested in uh, engaging in farming uh, also um, are eligible. So there is all kinds of uh, sources of funding from the, um, from the central government for that. And this is actually, also um, worked as a, as a pull factor for many um, younger um, newcomers um, that have recently moved to rural areas because they have read in social media from, other, from, experience, uh, from experiences of other people, friends and acquaintances. So um, talking about this kind of um, ruralities um, actually being uh, kind of uh, larger, larger than just entities, uh, geographical entities. Uh, quite a few of my colleagues uh, have um, elaborated on this idea that the countryside is actually not clearly defined, and it kind of keeps changing. So uh, my my colleague uh, John Trepagan has written a book about um, entrepreneurship in uh, Iwate Prefecture, northern Japan, and he has written that uh, cosmopolitan rurality neither fits neatly into the framework of the urban nor the rural. So um, he's really kind of describing uh, returnees who spend some time in cities, bring various um, cosmo cosmopolitan elements back to their hometowns and, uh, and uh, kind of open shops that um, have a very kind of cosmo cosmopolitan touch like um, Italian style uh, gelato, for example, or stuff like that. Um, and also my colleague, uh, Paul Hansen, has uh, coined a term called uh, Rubain, uh, which uh, he describes as the combination of urban values and aesthetic tastes that enter rural locations from the outside of metropolitan centers. So um, Hansen has um, done field work about central Hokkaido uh, and uh, many people from the Kansai area from West Japan who have uh, moved to the central Hokkaido and brought um, the lifestyle elements, uh, new values with them and reshaped um, the communities there. Um, and uh, this chapter, is, it can be found in this uh, edited volume, Rethinking Locality in Japan, uh, that has recently appeared. Um, so uh, I, I myself have also written um, in the same chapter, in this chain, uh, same edited volume, uh, a chapter about localized yet um, deterritorialized lives in rural Japan, describing entrepreneurs um, who move from Tokyo to Hokkaido and um, deeply engage with these communities, but at the same time also uh, maintain the relations with people beyond those um, communities. Uh, so um, having kind of uh, a much larger network uh, while um, living in a fairly uh, small place. So um, this really kind of um, obviously draws also on Doreen Messi's understanding of relational localities, uh, saying that localities are really um, not fixed, but uh, keep being uh, kind of um, negotiated um, and um, are not really fixed um, at any point. So um, on this note, I'd also like to briefly mention uh, the um, term related population, kanke um, jinko in Japanese. And um, this is a term that was um, coined by uh, Tanaka Tirumi, uh, which kind of was added uh, as a third group um, to um, the conventional uh, two groups of teju jinko. So, um, the permanent residents who always live in a given place, and second, uh, the Koryu Jinko, so uh, the exchange population, um, that uh, usually is 
it's about tourists, uh, short-term visitors, people who come and leave again, and um, who who just stay very short. But um, the the third group really um, is um, does not aim to live in that place, but uh, they uh, really um, have some kind of deep uh, engagement with the place, um, and. Even if they leave, they uh, tend to uh, maintain the relations with that place and um, kind of um, come back later at, uh, at a, another, uh, in the future. So uh, this could be researchers, uh, this could be um, jet teachers, um, this could be contemporary artists in residence. Um, so there's all kinds of people who really um, want to experience the everyday life of that community and uh, also make a really valid uh, contribution to that place uh, in, in their respective ways. So um, uh, I think this um, is really important to keep in mind this kind of notion of um, Kanki Jinko because it's gonna come up in the uh, stories of the social entrepreneurs as well. And um, talking about the representations of the rural um, recently in Japan, um, this kind of translocal, transnational aspect is, I think it's really also quite evident from just looking around uh, at lifestyle magazines. Uh, on the left, uh, this is a cover from uh, a, a lifestyle, lifestyle magazine for women, Frau, uh, woman in German. And um, this is a special um, issue uh, dedicated to making a trip to Tokushima and learning about sustainability uh, from last December. So. Clearly, this woman, uh, she looks extremely urban, um, stylish, um, and she's in this super nice nature setting. So it's really also about assemblage, bringing together totally divergent things. Uh, and the same for that um, lifestyle magazine on the right for, for men, uh, which is really about outdoor activities, fishing, um, surfing, camping. Um, and it actually talks about... Um, targeting people who want to use their, uh, their leisure time in, in a self-determined way. So um, in a way, rural areas are also um, associated with agency uh, in, in, in this way. So uh, just continuing on that translocal, transnational note, um, I just like to share this picture for fieldwork with you. Uh, this was uh, in, in one of the um, projects I'm gonna discuss. Um, the project in Miyagi Prefecture uh, in uh, northeastern Japan, which was um, uh, the site of, a, of the Great East Japan earthquake uh, in 2011. So uh, this place here uh, is a fishing village, a, a tiny fishing village, a uh, 30 minute drive from Ishinomaki city. And um, this is a project, a collaborative project between a former disaster volunteer and um, a local resident. Uh, who just came back from uh, the US uh, where he studied. Uh, he was studying in Hawaii. And um, uh, they, uh, seven people, uh, mostly millennials, um, decided to um, set up a cafe uh, and um, restore this place, which belongs to one of the, uh, the, to the grandparents to, of one of the members, um, and restore everything by themselves um, because they uh, did not have um, much funding. Uh, they actually had applied for funding, but uh, governmental funding uh, applications were rejected on the grounds that it doesn't make sense to open a cafe in a place that has hardly any people. <laughs> so this project is really about depopulation, aging, how to deal with it. And um, so their uh, application was rejected. Uh, they had to rely on their own sources of crowdfunding uh, and um, that is, this is also why they very much used um, DIY uh, vintage furniture and co in combination with this kind of original Showa um, wooden style. And this, so this is also very much about assembling different things, bringing together different people, different values and trying to create something new in the process. So uh, just a brief um, thing about the method. Um, I obtained my data uh, through um, ethnography, uh, to the, uh, through ethnography. So uh, it's a qualitative research project uh, that um, contains uh, more than 100 interviews over a period of nine years and um, across Japan. So it's a multi-sided uh, ethnographic study. 
Um, I, in, the, in addition to this, um, I've conducted follow-up fieldwork uh, last year. I, I spent a, a sp spent one month in Tokushima Prefecture doing uh, 33 interviews, mostly face-to-face. Uh, but some of the uh, some of the um, conversations I also um, did online for various reasons, um, and finally I also uh, did participant observation um, to um, round up the whole um, kind of data. Um, so this took quite a long time, but it also um, had an advantage in hindsight because um, if if you look at the uh, the, the the span, it was um, kind of pretty convenient in terms of um, policies. Um, Abe, um, Abe government uh, instituted uh, the uh, Chiho Sose policies, regional revitalization policies uh, from 2014. So I could actually kind of see the changes happening during that um, period. And um, I could see also the changes in, in um, uh, migrants that happened during that time. Uh, there was more and more funding available, so there was a clear change in generation uh, in lifestyle migrants uh, during the process. Um, and one concept I'd also like to um, to pick out today uh, that's also described in the book is um, the the idea of moratorium migration. We tend to think that migration is always about goals, very clear goals that people have, and ideas what people want to do after relocating. But in fact, um, after talking to quite a few of lifestyle migrants, it turns out that many actually um, are not so clear about um, what they exactly want to do. And some uh, just set out to relocate, hoping that they will find something. So um, this is why I have um, coined this idea of a moratorium migration as a mechanism uh, to which individuals in different life stages resort to in order to hedge their bets gain time and seek assurance, inspiration and courage to do what they ultimately feel makes sense to them in the neoliberal age. So um, I describe uh, moratorium migration as um, fusing the previously contradictory elements of lifestyle and precariat into a fuzzy gray zone where work, lifestyle, leisure, self-realization and precariousness all blend into one. So uh, it's really a kind of fusion of hope and feeling of transience and permanent limbo. Uh, that is kind of described in the book in, in more uh, detail, if people are interested. So um, just moving into the, um, to the topic of entrepreneurship, um, it's, uh, I think just looking at uh, statistics and also many um, uh, academic uh, journals and articles, it's quite clear that um, entrepreneurship um, is not, um, um, Japan is really not uh, a paradise for it, <laughs> at least until now. Uh, looking at the uh, data, uh, this is a, um, a kind of comparison of Japan uh, to, uh, in, with other countries. Uh, that is the percentage of entrepreneurs of, uh, in, um, in terms of um, the entire population of that country. So uh, Japan uh, features, uh, is the dark blue line here uh, at the bottom. 5.3%. Um, and, uh, and obviously, US uh, is, um, is highest. Um, and then next is um, uh, China at 10.4%. Uh, and then the UK. So uh, the numbers are pretty low. But um, on the other hand, um, the statistics also show that um, there is a slow growth uh, of entrepreneurship. And um, young people actually um, make up a pretty uh, big amount of, um, of uh, entrepreneurs. So people between 20 and 40 uh, are the main uh, kind of age cohort that make up entrepreneurs. And um, this is really also uh, in accordance with what I saw during fieldwork. So um, the uh, Ministry of uh, Economics definition of social business is really the uh, organizations that primarily focus on addressing societal prob uh, problems through business practices and adhere to three key principles, social mission, innovation, and feasibility, uh, which obviously is quite self-evident, but uh, it might be helpful to keep that in mind, especially feasibility uh, being quite a challenge. Some people having brilliant um, ideas like, uh, for example, I met a guy who was planning to um, provide a lunch um, service for um, kind of um, delivering uh, bento, lunch bentos for um, 
elderly people living by themselves. Um, a huge market in rural Japan, uh, but it just didn't work out as a viable um, business idea and uh, he had to stop it. Um, so um, the other two, two points, uh, I think I'm gonna discuss more um, when I present um, the, the cases. So I'll present three cases and the first two are gonna be from Tokushima Prefecture in Southwest Japan. Uh, and the first one, uh, this is um, called Shizuku. It's a graphic design company. Shizuku means drop uh, in Japanese. And this is uh, about water conservation. So um, it's, a, it's a company that was, um, that already existed in Osaka, uh, a young designer um, or maybe mid-age designer in his 40s, uh, who uh, relocated to Kamiyama town um, in uh, 2012. And um, first he left his company in Osaka, uh, but uh, after a year later, everyone working there was fine with relocating. So he uh, moved the company to uh, this small rural town as well uh, for various reasons. Um, he had had a long dream to um, relocate to, to rural area, also for lifestyle reasons. Um, he wanted to uh, do fishing and um, uh, surfing and all, all these kinds of things. Um, and also, uh, he wanted to um, really improve his work-life balance by uh, taking, uh, introducing an extended holiday, something that is not uh, really common in Japan. So um, an extended summer holiday for himself, but also for the entire, uh, uh, for all his employees, um, two months in the summer, um, which sounds great, but it also means a lot of pressure for the rest of the year, uh, as people are expected to achieve the same or perhaps even more, uh, given that uh, they are gen so generously granted um, a leisure time uh, exclusively to themselves and their families. So uh, this company is also really about uh, redefining uh, the way of working. And um, another thing uh, is um, the kind of um, so social mission uh, is really that um, uh, this graphic design company um, is trying to um, make contribution to um, the uh, forest, um, uh, the local forests, um, cedar forests. Um, there are plenty of such forests um, because they were planted um, post-war um, to um, provide um, wood uh, for uh, the growing forest industry. But this kind of was not uh, financially uh, viable anymore um, after the influx of much cheaper uh, wood from Asian countries. So uh, the forests were not uh, maintained anymore, which led to less and less uh, water in the rivers because um, the kind of uh, forests kept the sun from getting to the ground and um, less water as a result. So the idea for this company is really to uh, go out into the woods regularly and um, see that uh, the woods are maintained so that um, woods are cut and also they can actually um, get the wood um, as a resource for working uh, on the product, uh, but also making a contribution to the ecosystem, uh, to the local ecosystem and um, kind of uh, seeing to it that more river water remains um, in um, after uh, that kind of in intervention, if you like. So it's really kind of um, making a, a product, but also uh, contributing to the, uh, to the eco cycle um, at the same time. And um, yeah, so uh, the problem of course is that um, it sounds great on the one hand, but also um, this company has been quite successful. They have received um, the Good Design Award. They have received uh, an award from the Ministry of Agriculture uh, last December. So uh, they have uh, attracted more and more um, acknowledgement from various stakeholders. Uh, and as a result, they've actually been busier and busier uh, with um, the kind of idea of having an extended holiday uh, being more and more difficult to actually implement. So in a way, this story is quite inspiring on one hand, but on the other hand, it's also sobering because it kind of implies that if you, the more successful you are, the less uh, leisure people can actually get and um, the less difficult, the more difficult it gets to uh, becomes to actually uh, implement what they set out to do in the first place. Something that I guess, uh, many academics also um, face uh, in their lives. So um, 
yeah, maybe this is also something to think about or discuss later. Um, the second case uh, I'd like to present is um, a female um, entrepreneur in, in, uh, in the context of tourism, ecotourism, uh, an entrepreneur with a Bangladeshi touch. So um, this is uh, Dana, who is in her uh, early 30s, and she's from the uh, great, um, greater Tokyo area. She studied um, international development uh, at university and then uh, worked in uh, Bangladesh for two years. After that, um, she uh, actually applied for this program I mentioned before, the Chiki Okosh Kyodoktai program, um, kind of living and working in a local, in a rural town, trying to, co uh, to contribute to the community. And after doing this uh, for two years, uh, she uh, opened her own guest house um, in this wonderful spot in the mountains of, um, this, uh, of Kamiyama town. And um, she's saying, I think life should be fun above everything. Otherwise, it's just too stressful. Having fun, helping others and not suffering are the main things needed to achieve a balanced life, in my opinion. Personally, it makes me happy if I can see the faces of people I work for rather than sitting in some office every day. Um, and uh, so uh, her guest house is, is clearly shaped by uh, her Bangladesh uh, experience. Um, visitors can, um, can take cooking lessons for, for curry, how to cook curry uh, with a Bangladesh touch, of course, uh, and uh, using the local vegetables. Uh, the, this is a picture also of, of the porch um, with a fantastic view um, and um, it's all kind of DIY uh, and um, it does have also a little bit of a South Asian feel somehow. It doesn't feel like Japan to me, <laughs> at least. So um, I was staying there for my follow-up field work. Uh, it was um, interesting in the sense that guests were asked to bring their own towels. Uh, so it's um, quite a few environmentally friendly practices trying to cut down on, on, um, on waste also, uh, trying to work together also, cook together on a daily basis um, and um, meet all, all kinds of diverse people staying in that um, place. So um, it also, the guest house also offered um, visitors a chance to uh, engage in uh, farming if they're interested. So there's all kinds of um, opportunities to get a sense of um, everyday life in that town as well. So um, Lena altogether is very happy to, uh, to have made this choice, but at the same time, she's extremely busy. Uh, she has hardly a day off. She, uh, not only does she do the guest house, she also uh, does all kinds of other jobs like uh, writing, uh, cleaning, uh, taking care of uh, children uh, to boost her income. Um, she was uh, obviously, uh, her income was affected by the pandemic, um, but uh, from mid uh, la last year, um, there were, again, uh, more and more guests, um, especially domestic guests, of course. And uh, so the guest house is going quite well. It was also mentioned as a sustainable guest house in the Lifestyle magazine uh, recently. So um, she's now restoring the guest house and, um, and gearing up in a way. So, um, so this is also one story of someone who um, set out to, to do something and she's joking, my way to go about things, maybe low risk, low return. So she's trying not to, to invest a lot of money, but uh, relying on social capital, on her connections a lot. And, and this is working out quite well. Um, she is enjoying her life, although she has very little time. And this is quite far from the slow life we imagine uh, about rural um, areas altogether. Something that I think applies for all newcomers. The last case I'd like to present is um, the Hamaguri Hama project, um, the cafe I mentioned um, in the beginning, this collaborative project. So it's really about um, doing the impossible. That is um, a few um, millennials getting together um, and opening a cafe in a place uh, with only two households after the disaster struck. Um, something people would say, this is madness. Why would you do that? But um, quite a lot of people actually <laughs> turned up as visitors to the point uh, that local residents complained uh, about the noise, about uh, the influx, because it was a fishing village that never had any tourism. And so um, they had a problem of over tourism at some point. And um, this led uh, the, um, the members of the project to um, shift um, the cafe from a, a normal 
um, kind of um, uh, cafe to uh, reservation only uh, uh, cafe, uh, limited only to two or three days a week uh, to uh, limit uh, the burden on the community, but also to limit the burden on themselves, because it turns out that they had to uh, work very long hours, but um, it was not financially viable, really. And um, especially now with the pandemic, um, they have decided to um, expand the project uh, more into um, other activities. Uh, this is a picture of the boathouse um, that was also built uh, by themselves um, and um, that kind of brings together marine sport activities um, with um, barbecue, enjoying barbecues and, um, and other kind of um, uh, experiential tourist activities that don't uh, burden the community so much. Um, also, with the, with the uh, continuing pandemic, um, project members have said that um, they have uh, rediscovered local resources more. Um, for example, two or three members are, um, have tried to think about um, how to make use of um, resources that are plentiful um, available in, in the place, such as deer, for example. Um, there's plenty of deer in the mountains. Of that um, of the town, and so they have tried to hunt um, deer and um, process the meat and um, sell it online, for example. So, uh, so one of the the project members uh, actually points out that um, the um, just looking around, you can actually find uh, all kinds of um, raw treasures, raw diamonds, uh, and if you polish them. Uh, these diamonds will actually shine. So in a way, uh, this project can be uh, seen as experimenting with novel forms of economic activities that um, actually uh, depart from conventional focus on cash. And um, sh sure, the project members uh, concede that they um, earn much less than in the previous uh, jobs, but uh, they are also quite happy with um, life as it is now. So. Um, I would now like to, to move into the last bit about um, post pandemic, or maybe we should just keep it pandemic reflections for now. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to start with a statistic um, from the Japanese internal ministry that shows clearly that from the mid 2020, um, there was a, a larger number of people um, leaving Tokyo than uh, moving into Tokyo. So uh, we could say that this is really a kind of um, sign of the uh, change, uh, changing game in a way, that people uh, with remote work um, and also with increasing uh, crisis, sense of crisis about living in a very densely populated place, people have started to, um, to consider uh, rural moves and have actually implemented uh, them as well. Uh, so the pandemic seems to ha have pushed a lot of people who are already thinking uh, about moving, but not kind of finding it possible before, uh, and and push them really to uh, to realizing uh, their their dreams of moving. And um, so another thing is also a part, in addition to the remote work, um, there have been more uh, companies who uh, relocated their headquarters to rural areas, and also there's an important um, term uh, the, the uh, vacation in Japanese, the combination of work and vacation that has been promoted by the central government um, to entice corporate employees to work in rural areas for a limited period of time. Uh, the Japan Tourism Agency has allocated 5 billion Japanese yen uh, to, uh, in its 2021 budget uh, to implement vacation related activities, hoping to boost uh, the stagnating uh, tourism industry. So location may also add to um, changing mindsets uh, towards uh, rural moves. And um, finally, uh, I think uh, there has been uh, also uh, more and more diverse um, groups uh, of the population who um, are associated with uh, life in, in rural Japan. Uh, for example, uh, young women. Um, there, there was uh, this term of no garu, uh, farming girl, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, which kind of shows that uh, agri agriculture, uh, which uh, conventionally is associated with um, senior citizens um, and pretty low paid manual labor, um, that has kind of been reappropriated as something that is stylish and um, appealing to uh, young girls um, 
uh, disseminated on social media, uh, on blogs, uh, etc. Um, and uh, also, uh, this kind of change has is also uh, evident in uh, in various um, books. This is a, a book um, written by a 38 year old newcomer, female newcomer, to Yamanashi Prefecture about what she thinks uh, really is crucial in making a uh, being a successful newcomer in a rural area uh, as a single woman. So single women generally uh, have um, seem to kind of um, really consider rural life as a as an increasing uh, option um, and uh, i've met quite a few um, female entrepreneurs as well um, who do not have families but still uh, move to uh, rural japan to implement their entrepreneurial activities so um, this kind of shows that um, there is an increasing diversity that we find in rural areas um, and um, I would say it's quite safe to assume that this increase is gonna continue. And with this increase, obviously also entrepreneurial activities are gonna um, kind of uh, expand and increase um, because um, the countryside uh, really offers quite a few opportunities uh, for people who, are, who have creative ideas, but not so uh, much cash to actually put these ideas into practice. Um, and uh, just uh, just to end up with, um, I'd like to um, to uh, mention an upcoming publication. Um, I've just co-edited a special issue with my colleague Paul Hansen um, on the theme of exploring heterotopia in rural Japan, a theme that is very much uh, closely related to such entrepreneurial ventures uh, as well. Uh, and uh, this is for forthcoming in Asian anthropology, so this may be of interest for some people. Uh, and thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Susanna. Uh, uh, a clap from me and everyone else, I, I think, out there. Um, we would rather have, have, have seen you uh, live, but uh, at this point, Zoom will do. I, um, I would also like to introduce someone who's just come on screen, my colleague here at uh, Wakayama University at the Center for Tourism Research, Dr. Husna Abidin. Welcome, Husna. Husna will be helping with questions. When she unmutes, we'll be able to hear her voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we can't hear voice anyway. What we will do is we, there is a question already from Januszka Schmidt, who's in the Netherlands at Groningen University. Good morning, Januszka. Thank you for joining us so early. Um, uh, you, your question, and, and for those, for anyone who wants to ask a question, you can also raise your hand and ask the question in person rather than just type it through on the chat. So, um, technology, we are very at, we are at the cutting edge. So, <laughs> if, if you would like to do that rather than type a question in, please do so. So, Janushka has asked a question, uh, uh, which you can see there, um, Susanna. Can you see the question from Janushka? in the chat she says i yeah so uh test if you think that with kishida's new capitalism plans to strengthen startups will rural migration by young entrepreneurs increase yeah definitely uh, there's there's been uh, an announcement quite recently about uh, the day in uh, kind of expanding uh, pushing um, in urbanites further to uh, move to rural areas. Uh, so uh, I think it's definitely going to increase because um, on the one hand, people, I think, have an increasing uh, sense of crisis about densely populated areas due to the pandemic, uh, especially now with the explosion, explosive numbers uh, in, in urban uh, areas. And um, plus, um, also, kind of more awareness about um, the, the safe safety uh, safe safety kind of aspect of being close to food and clear water is something that people uh, did not think about so much before. So, if you have a disaster, for example, like an earthquake, you're totally kind of you you find out that you're kind of pretty fragile and vulnerable because uh, your infrastructure networks are kind of. Um, not working, convenience stores and stuff. So a lot of people after the Great East Japan earthquake uh, kind of reshaped their values on that one and thought um, it's not only about income, but it's also about um, kind of safety, uh, safety and security. So I would definitely uh, think so that um, people that there's going to be more um, uh, further 
trends uh, in, in that in that direction. Okay, um, Husna's joining us now. We can hear her. Hello, Husna. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, and yeah, I hope that managed, um, that answered the previous question. Well, I, think, I think I, I, I did not see the last, the second bit, uh, which, which is about um, how this increase in predominantly young entrepreneurs with new uh -huh. ideas is received by the already existing local communities. So this is a great uh, question, I think. Um, generally, um, it depends a lot on the history and the, uh, the topography of the community. Some people, some communities are extremely welcoming because um, especially communities that have extreme high rate of aging, uh, they welcome every single young person because it makes a huge demographic change to them. Um, so uh, I would say generally positively, but um, I've also heard some crit critical comments from entrepreneurs or people trying to, to be entrepreneurs uh, in rural areas saying that uh, the towns are not doing enough to support them uh, once they have embarked on their activities. So um, it's also a problem in some places that there is, there's not enough of an entrepreneurial um, culture uh, that exists. And so it's quite challenging for people coming in and embarking on new ventures. Yep, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And moving on to our next question, we have one from Damon, who said, really appreciate the presentation. Can you say that there is a dominant factor which makes these projects more likely to be successful? So in the example of character of persons, maybe? Yeah, I would say that um, the, the kind of um, communication with uh, the engagement with the local community is extremely important. Uh, everything you do in very small towns depends on your network and who yeah. you can actually reach out to. So people who have uh, really good social skills uh, have a much better um, obviously starting point than people who, who feel who feel they're socially awkward or feel it's difficult for them to make connections True. so i would say uh kind of the capability to 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 be on a good um relation with it, with anyone and everyone in the town obviously yeah. has a much higher chance to, exactly. to also in terms of of, um, of business so having a large term large vision combining it with uh, a sense of pragmatism and social skills it seems like a, a good starting point yeah and it leads to another question that i was quite wondering um are there any sort of interest from foreign migrants mm, yeah i actually um so this is one of the um, the kind of surprises um, I had when I went back for for follow up field work uh, quite recently. Um, it turns out that Kamiyama had actually attracted quite a few um, um, foreign uh, like uh, migrants from overseas. So mm. um, the British, British people, um, people from Silicon Valley, wow. um, all kinds of people who had moved in uh, during the four years I'd been away. And, uh, and, the, and many of them were actually um, had opened cafes, had opened um, studios and all kinds of things. So uh, they were saying, actually, some of them were saying that there is not, not enough entrepreneurial drive in, uh, in rural Japan compared to Silicon Valley. But then yeah. maybe this is not a good, a really ideal thing to compare it to. Yeah, but, but that's really interesting to see the interest from um, foreigners. Um, and yeah, Joseph. Okay, um, it's uh, yeah. Uh, sitting here, I must say, I have often thought to myself, when I'm no longer an academic, I'll move to the country and have chickens and you know live by the river and take it easy, right? But of course, you know the rural ideal, which is all of that, for those who are entrepreneurial, seems to be quite a contradiction, right? Because entrepreneurial spirits suggest expanding, growing, mm. you know, um, whereas moving to the rural areas seems to be this kind of, there's this in-between space, there's a dance between wanting to be one thing and another thing. Is this tension quite evident in people who make this move? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think this is like one of the dilemmas that most people need to kind of solve. Um, everyone needs to, to solve it for themselves in, in their kind of personal way, but kind of uh, finding the, uh, the just right momentum 
I, I think this also goes for us as academic in a way, you know, sometimes you always think you need to do more, <laughs> you need to kind of uh, always kind of do the next step. But on the other hand, uh, we need to think about also what is actually what makes sense and what makes sense in terms of um, a well-being, subjective well-being. Uh, and this is actually what a lot of people have been talking, you know, um, the, the people from the Hamaguri Hama project, they were like, in the beginning, they were like doing all, working extremely hard, trying to accommodate as many guests as possible. It was all about quantity, reaching a certain number, bringing in a lot of people so that they have an income. But at some point they realized it actually doesn't make sense. Um, it was totally opposite of what they want. Uh, and they actually scaled it down. So scale uh, is really, I think, an important key word uh, that um, most people are struggling to negotiate for themselves. And some people just go on and on and never kind of, uh, with the result that the, what they actually aspire to is just out of reach. And this is what I've written about in the book, people kind of having this vision, this aspiration, what they would like to be, but this aspiration also being just out of reach, which seems to be kind of, uh, our, our kind of um, age in a way. <laughs> you, you raised a very interesting point about the, the gendered nature of this shift and how more single women are moving to rural areas. So I, I see an opportunity for, for one of these rural areas to say to all the single men in the city, come and come to us. We have all the single women here. You know, that Perfect. kind of, uh, it's an interesting uh, development how this has become gendered. Have they given up on men in the city and would rather go and raise cows and chickens instead uh, <laughs> um, without trivializing it too much. Um, there, there's a question from uh, uh, Kazuo Nakamoto here at the Center for Tourism Research. She says, um, this is, she thanks you for the interesting presentation and says there are different types of immigrants, U, J and I turns. And I'm wondering if you could touch on those differences and whether you think U turners always tend to stay longer or is the shift often a temporary thing they they are when they don't become committed to the community they then go back to where they come from hmm. uh, I would say that most of the people I talked to uh, were um, kind of um, newcomers so um, they didn't have any connections and um, still um, I think it depended a lot on how they entered uh, that place some were actually headhunted <laughs> uh, because they were considered uh, as kind of um, attractive uh, human resource by some st stakeholders in the town. Uh, others had um, knew some people in that place um, and decided to move in. Um, so uh, I have to say that most, there was very few people who are U-turners uh, in my experience. So I can't really give a comprehensive comparison. But I, I heard that now with the pandemic, um, some places have seen increasing um, kind of um, retinees. So um, people who um, were locals, but left, um, worked somewhere else for quite a long time and decided that now is the time to come, go back and uh, do something for their hometown. And, and these retinees actually uh, happened to, to get on extremely well with newcomers. So forming a kind of new community of um, people who want to do new stuff uh, in that town. So this really kind of uh, got the sense that this gives a vibrant touch to the, to the town because it's kind of new young people who kind of have both internal and external perspective. So yeah. uh, they, I think chances are pretty low that they would move on to other places because they have come back, right? So. So, so how does this new community coexist neatly alongside the pre-existing community where the demographics are probably very different, right? You've got this co cohort of young new migrants in their own community yeah. moving into the space of a pre-existing community. Um, how does that negotiate and do they eventually overlap and coexist nicely or mm. do they just live parallel lives next to each other? No, I think in, uh, in, in Kamiyama where I observed it, um, it was like um, different, it's such a small place that it's, I think it's impossible to have a total um, parallel society. People always kind of meet on various functions and occasions. So also across uh, the generational gap. So uh, I, I got the sense that this really uh, goes into a nice direction because um, there's a lot of new ideas um, and 
uh, if it would only be returnees and um, people who spend all their time in that town, uh, those people would say, why do you want to do this? We've never done this and this is not the way it's being done. While you come as a much have much higher chance of saying, oh, this sounds like a great thing. Maybe we should consider it rather than just dismissing it in the first place. So uh, I think the um, kind of um, exchange about uh, things that have not been done before is kind of people are more active about it. So I would consider it a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, and I'd like to bring back to the motivations of why many people migrate to the rural areas. And this is combining two, uh, two people's questions. Uh, and so you previously mentioned about social entrepreneurship, which means that profit is not really the main objective. So in your opinion, what do you think is the main objective? Which also relates to another um, one of the audience question asking, what's the objective of international foreign people coming to Japan, um, to the rural Japan and migrating there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, so I would say that um, the kind of um, aim of uh, these different entrepreneurial activities um, is quite diverse. So uh, it's difficult to say all of them are setting out to do this. Um, I think um, the kind of balance of having uh, making a social contribution and um, being financially viable is uh, everyone has different definition, definitions of that. so these also may change with time uh, over time for one of the same company or one of the same uh, kind of mpo uh, so uh, i think for most people is really to do something they enjoy doing and they're passionate about they believe in and they think that ultimately it brings about change of some sort, but maybe not in a dramatic way of doing a kind of <laughs> sudden change, but more like achieving a gradual change uh, that is not yeah. too painful, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. So it's more like a, a policy of small steps uh, at a time, but in a, in a way, in a, at a speed that feels comfortable for people and that is also compatible for people's life stages in a way. So. Yeah, and people finding um, work that's more meaningful, which in a way relates to this recent paper I read, to looking at cultural differences using Hofstede's cultural dimensions. And in that study, it was seeing how actually Japanese culture, because it's more um, feminine and looking more towards harmony, that's why people are more inclined to find purpose and meaningful activities to work for. And perhaps it would be similar with other migrants from other more feminine countries based on that theory. Hmm. And, and Joseph, do you have any further questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, uh, uh, that was um, uh, Yusuke Kawase's question. Uh, Welcome, I'm a university student. Thanks for attending. Uh, Yusuke-san, you will go to the top of the class. Um, uh, so Damon asked, has asked a question that I'm very much interested in too. How do you get headhunted, Susanna? <laughs> so uh, in that town I'm talking about, uh, there's like a few key stakeholders um, who kind of um, decide uh, about uh, what direction the town should be going and um, make a, few, a lot of decisions, really kind of um, self-determined decisions, much more than in other towns, I think. Uh, and, uh, and these people kind of um, have a pretty big network um, that goes like... Um, of course, beyond the community, but also beyond Japan uh, in some cases. And they would really think about what kind of people do they want. Uh, so uh, one of the key stakeholders ha has actually um, said that uh, for them, it's not about quantity. It's about quality of attracting people. And they want, um, they of course, interested in attracting people of very uh, unique um, kind of uh, skills, set of skills. It, all, it almost sounds like an <laughs> interview, I guess. Oh, interview. <laughs> but uh, this is the kind of mindset. And this, I think this is the reason why they, they have this kind of mindset is also that they are locals, but they also spend time in the US. Uh, one of the stakeholders um, did his education in the US. So uh, I think they have a different view of how to approach things. And uh, they don't want to have masses of people uh, moving in, but they want to have um, people who can contribute something that makes uh, a, a good difference to the, to the community. And um, 
I think they have pretty good um, sense of, of selection, uh, is what I saw. <laughs> yes, yes. You, you, you mentioned, Susanna, in, and uh, this is a question that some academics would be very interested in, two, two theoretical kind of approaches to understanding this Traphagen's cosmopolitan rurality and Hansen's Ruhrbein. It almost talks about two contrasting things, you know, like as a binary between two things and we're trying to squeeze it together. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is that an uncomfortable kind of initiative or is it something that is it, it naturally flows because this idea of cosmopolitan rurality mm -hmm. makes me immediately think of what happens in urban contexts where there's this shift in, in, in demographics and it often leads to gentrification. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, does this kind of gentrification happen in rural context? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a really important point you raise and, and something I've, I was also thinking uh, when I went back for follow-up fieldwork because there was a time of four years in between. Uh, I hadn't been to the place, uh, so I could really see the change. And it struck me that, um, of course, there's lots of good things about attracting all kinds of people, but there's also the kind of danger of um, unification and places just looking like <laughs> having the whole infrastructure you find in the city, like having all these uh, kind of stylish espresso cafes and hip, uh, hip kind of... Uh, uh, takeaways and all that you know it kind of starts taking on this kind of um, color that you find anywhere else uh, which yeah I, I guess I was thinking you know is, is, is this really the ideal way to go but then it means of course the people uh, newcomers who um, who recently arrived they find it very comforting because it kind of is basically comforting their needs uh, and, and fulfilling their needs and making them feel at home, uh, although they basically don't know much about the place. So I guess it's accommodating uh, recent newcomers who, who don't plan to uh, engage with the place very deeply. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that in with the provision of incentives and very often, you know, this is what drives people to visit, to, to move in the first place. You talked about structural, institutional and financial which one of the three is 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 more important to this this endeavor to get people to move to rural areas in my mind i'm thinking surely if many of these people have very little capital the financial incentive must be a key driver but maybe i'm 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 underestimating the structural and institutional drivers mm, yeah that's a really difficult uh, one to to reply to but i think um, when I started our research, I also had this image that most people would not have much cash. But um, actually, when I was doing a research in Ishinomaki area after the disaster in 2011, one of my interlocutors was saying that the people who can stay long term uh, either have great social networks or they are rich. <laughs> uh, so it like uh, it kind of implies that quite a lot of the people um, who um, stay uh, actually are pretty affluent, and that's also what I what I found during my research. Quite uh, quite a few of those people are actually pretty affluent. Um, they have pretty high levels of education. Um, many went to grad school, many uh, spent time overseas. Um, so it's not the poorest people um, in Japan that uh, kind of do this kind of thing, it, it seems. So I think this would also be really uh, worth uh, researching more like right. uh, points of, of class and uh, affluence because it's a bit of a taboo topic also. Mm. And having the safety net, you know, affluent people have the safety net to go back if it doesn't work out. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can see Damon's very interested in this this topic, and Damon I, seems like he wants to be part of it. Yeah. Damon, <laughs> it's Damon, exciting. Yeah, he says so. The town and leadership must predecide uh, who uh, they who they predecide they wish as a community to promote these type of activities. So he's talking about who makes the decisions in regards to who moves there. He also asks follow up question: mm -hmm. How does an individual consider entering this new activity, finding a village that has open arms? Yeah, so I think uh, quite um, uh, there is a kind of, I think the competition to attract uh, newcomers has really um, geared up now with the pandemic. Um, so a lot of the communities are kind of thinking of ways how to attract people because 
every town obviously wants them uh, and especially people with uh, young kids uh, is, is, is of course um, the, the kind of best <laughs> the be the ideal settler uh, so um, the long-term strategy the long the long-term strategy yeah I guess um, working on an on an online presentation like uh, the, the way the town presents itself uh, on the internet is really important um, and a lot of uh, the, the local communities rural communities are not particularly strong on IT <laughs> presentation. So quite a, a few of the people I talked to were saying that um, they uh, actually chose the place because they were really impressed by the professional uh, online um, kind of um, presentation, uh, the way the town presented itself on the internet, on the homepage. And it turns out that this town actually um, consulted with a lot of, of um, non-locals uh, to think about how what, what makes sense to present to what kind of attractions to present and, and what kind of um, strengths to focus on. So uh, clearly, the kind of uh, external and internal perspectives, both of them need to be kind of reflected. And with a lot of communities who haven't had a lot, enough exchange, perhaps they would not even be. Um, Kind of conscious of what is really attractive for people from cities <laughs> because they would just argue we don't have much we don't have anything there is nothing here <laughs> so it's it's a clear case of not having the kind of reflection of what is really attractive for people who've spent all their lives in in, in, a, in an urban context. yeah and do you think neighboring towns and villages would actually collaborate with each other to attract uh, and um, share their attractiveness, their strengths in searching for new uh, people to move in? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I think, that unfortunately, I have to say most neighboring uh, towns are not particularly on good terms. <laughs> that's what I saw. So it's like, if, if you would have an area, uh, like where it would really make sense to work together, uh, most, most places would say that they did not collaborate uh, for various historic hostilities or mm. sense of competition. So uh, there will be very few cases um, where neighboring communities would actually um, work together. <laughs> so they're competing against each other. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, I think so. From um, what I the term in business yeah. schools that business school students use, cooperation. Yeah, cooperation. Yanushka yeah, yeah. um, has a question about this idea of meaningful work. And I think it's a really interesting question because people move to rural areas, presumably, and I sense this in your book, because mm -hmm. of this search for meaning in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Janushka asks, what we, can, what we consider meaningful seems often different for different mm -hmm. cultures. Janushka is in the Netherlands at the moment. Can you say what meaningful means in a Japanese context? And can you elaborate why the rural area is so central to the concept of meaningful work? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, um... First of all, I find it very hard to re reply to the question of what is kind of meaningful in Japanese terms, because Japan is a huge country, as, as we can see now, uh, Joseph sitting in Wakayama, where it's kind of maybe plus, uh, I don't know how much degrees, <laughs> warm, right? <laughs> and here... Okay, okay now weather, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but here it's like minus, I think it's minus five today. Wow. Uh, and uh, we've we have snow for half a year, so it doesn't feel like the same country as as Joseph's place, right? <laughs> so um, and also the, the many of the people I, I talked about um, are Japanese by nationality, but they have spent quite a long time uh, in other places in other countries. So uh, they might actually bring together um, a fusion of things, uh, which so I, I wonder whether this is Japanese and whether there's a point of focusing on nationality here. I think it's more about individual, what kind of makes sense to people on an individual level. Um, and a lot of the people I interviewed um, said they of course want to work, but they want to also um, decide the pace of their work. And they actually want to do work that, where they can, as Rena san, see the faces of people rather than just going to some office every day. And, and be a, a clog in the, in the machine in a way. So they want to kind of do a work that where they feel they 
they are appreciated as humans as well, rather than just being a, a bit in a rather in a big mechanism in a big institution. So I think a lot of people are questioning uh, the kind of meaningfulness of working in a large institution where they just do um, kind of follow instructions. Uh, so a lot of people are mentioning that they want to do something self-determined where they can actually organize themselves. And this is why also I think um, setting up a, a, some kind of entrepreneurial activity is really fulfilling for many people, even if it's very challenging. And it re reminds me of the term, I know when I first started um, chatting to you about this, I used the term rural decline and you said, well, actually I prefer to talk about demographic change rather than rural decline, right? Because the, the term decline is value laden and it depends on the individual as to what, what they put value in. Mosan, who's in Hiroshima, who you know asks, is asking a question. Oh, it's a very important one about when you encounter people who fail to stay in rural places, mm -hmm. what tends to be the drivers for their leaving? Yeah, I, I think this is also a topic that should really be further explored, like people who are trying to, to kind of uh, ex explore the, the motives of people who left and how they did afterwards, um, because it's extremely difficult to keep track of people who left. Mm, but um, I, I interviewed someone who left um, Tokushima uh, in Hokkaido, actually, and uh, it turns out that they kind of felt uh, it was totally out of sync with them, them personally. Um, it just didn't fit them, the whole rural lifestyle. They felt uh, surveilled all the time. They didn't uh, have, they, they didn't feel they have a sense of privacy uh, and they didn't like it at all. So um, for some people, it just, uh, it just doesn't kind of work. Uh, but uh, also I've heard other stories of people just leaving from one day to the next, leaving everything behind. <laughs> so there have been really horrifying stories of people just disappearing, wow. <laughs> which of course is also really miracle uh, for, for on the community yeah. um, because they felt perhaps they were not successful in their ventures. So there's all kinds of stories actually. Well, we, uh, we have a few more minutes. Husna, did you want to make any final reflections or uh, Damon has, posed a couple of comments there that scale may be the answer and that rural communities in Japan still dominate societal values. Um, any comments on that or responses? Yeah, absolutely. I think scale is really like um, the key uh, idea because I think rural areas um, offer people um, kind of because it's less expensive um, to live there, um, they have more time and more kind of, uh, they theoretically have more time to think and reflect on things. And um, some people I've met also um, said they actually scale down their working time uh, because the rent is so cheap. So they don't have to, uh, to work so much anymore and they only do what they actually enjoy. So it's almost like focusing on, on, on really the work you are interested in only, which is pure luxury from our point of view of course but I think it's really something to to keep um to, to maybe um think about for all of us in the future <laughs> yeah well for me I I see lots of parallels in what happens in Japan in, in other countries exactly yeah yeah you know, about, you know these I, I yesterday I saw an ad for this I can't remember a town in rural Italy calling for people to move there you know you will get the house for free and it's this house that was built 300 years ago but you know there were conditions you had to renovate it you had to live yeah. it you had to live in it and other things like that yeah. so I think this is a, a global uh, uh, phenomenon rather than just a Japanese thing with your 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 book this one this book suggests that there are some Japanese flavors to the way it plays out but you know generally the overarching principles are similar yeah um, absolutely yeah um Husna, do you have another Oh, my thoughts are similar to yours, Joseph, thinking that it is a global um, occurrence, especially with COVID, more people are considering about moving to rural areas. And especially for me, reflecting earlier this year, me and my family, we stayed at our grandmother's place for half of the year because Malaysia was in lockdown. We'd rather stay in a, uh, within nature, within the forest and the waterfall. 
Um, but yeah, this will be a very important aspect to look into for the future of research. And please do have a read at Professor Klein's uh, book. And there's also, um, in closing, there's also that special issue in Asian anthropology, I think you mentioned. Can you just remind us what that is again, uh, the special issue? We'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's about heterotopia in rural Japan. So um, it's a set of papers uh, that uh, discuss um, newcomers in rural areas, entrepreneurs um, in different locations, uh, and how people actually um, kind of uh, people who don't really fit in there quite well or feel that the values are different, how they actually um, kind of negotiate between trying to blend in and trying to kind of pursue their path, basically. <laughs> Very good. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll all look that up. So on behalf of um, us here at the Centre for Tourism Research, thank you, Susanna, for taking the time to present to us today. Uh, thank you to everyone who's, who's tuned in. I, Janushka's left you a message, Janushka's in the Netherlands. Thank you, Thank Janushka, you, you can go and have your breakfast now. Um, and anyone else who might be watching this recorded version, um, uh, if you need to know more, there's a, there's a, you can go to Google Scholar and type in um, Susanna Kleon's name and you'll find the papers that she's written and the, and the book reference as well. So um, unless you have any closing comments, Susanna, um, should we say thank you? Uh, but it's yeah, thanks so much for everyone attending and thanks Joseph for this great opportunity. I really loved uh, yeah. discussing. Okay, Th thanks a lot everyone. Thank you Husna, thank you. Thank you. To, thank you to the team behind the scenes. There's yes. Miko san and Maki san. Thank you for thank your help you um, and everybody else. Thanks for watching and we'll uh, hopefully we'll have another very interesting webinar coming soon. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank